You know, the practices that are associated with a number of religious traditions actually suppress that questioning thinking. It can be challenging to get people to recognize that they themselves are limiting their own thinking as a result of those trained patterns. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective on important societal issues. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. On this episode, I'm going to be interviewing a psychologist who teaches critical thinking. She uses creationism as an example for her students. She also analyzes behavior from an evolutionary perspective. This fits into an ongoing series of podcasts that I'm doing that look at um, evolution and creationism, evidence for and against. As always, if you like what you hear, please press like on your podcast app and share it with your friends. Um, Come join us on our Facebook group, The Rational View, or visit my website at www.therationalview.ca. Professor Lynn Honey received a BA in psychology from Algoma University and then a PhD at McMaster University, specializing in learning and behavior from a physiological and evolutionary perspective. She tended bar, drove a taxi, and cleaned apartment buildings to pay for her expensive education habits. She has been at McEwen University since 2003, where she is a professor in the Department of Psychology. She is an award-winning educator who teaches a variety of courses related to learning and behavior, including evolutionary approaches to human behavior. Her published research includes work in animal learning and behavior, human mate choice and competition, and post-secondary education. And her family says that she's annoyingly good at board games. Professor Honey, welcome to The Rational View. Thank you for having me. And thank you so much for coming on. So can you tell our listeners a little bit about your background and how you came to be interested in psychology and, and evolutionary psychology? So I, I started off, um, uh, I didn't start off as a, as a psych major. Uh, when I was a high school student, my, my best grades were in English. So I had this view I was going to be a writer, you know, chain smoking, wearing black, living in New York, the usual. Um, and so when I started university, I started as an English major. And then in taking both English and psych at the same time, I, I realized that the English profs had a lot more respect for Freud than my psych profs did. <laughs> and starting to uh, mm. a lot of the, um, essentially the, the debunking. Uh, and that was something that really grabbed me about psychology was, you know, as a relatively young science, it, it, it's got a bit of an inferiority complex. And it's constantly revising itself and, and pushing for methodological rigor. And that really, really appealed to me. Uh, but in addition to that, I took some animal behavior classes uh, in psychology. And, well, it was, it was game over for me at that point. That stuff's just too much fun to, to walk away from. Yeah, interesting. And that, that's um, something that I, I came across as well. And I've done a podcast on... Uh, you know the replication crisis in the social sciences, and and obviously that must be on on professionals' minds quite a bit, is to to have a, that scientific rigor. It's it's so exciting. I think that there's a lot of people who are kind of depressed about the replication pr- crisis, and I'll admit to um, you know feeling pretty sad about some results that didn't replicate. That you know I'm like oh that was a cool one, <laughs> um, but at the same time I feel like this is what science is supposed to do. It's supposed to constantly make itself better. And we don't do that by pretending that everything is fine and that what we know now is what we're going to know in 10 or 20 or a hundred years. So I think the replication crisis is a, is a wonderful opportunity in my field. And uh, there's a couple other fields I think should have one of their own. (laughs) Do name names. (laughs) (laughs) topic of today. <laughs> yeah. uh, very, very good. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. Um, so uh, a very interesting bio. Uh, you've obviously done a lot of things in your, in your educational journey. Uh, I'm also a fan of board games. Is your psychological expertise a secret weapon? Uh, rarely. 
Um, but every now and then my knowledge of critters has come in very handy. So if you've played the board game uh, Wingspan, um, which is a personal favorite in this household, uh, okay. having a little bit of ornithological understanding it can be quite beneficial. Wingspan, I, I haven't heard of that. It sounds, sounds interesting. Ab- stunningly pretty game, for one thing. Like The artwork in it is gorgeous. Um, it's kind of a worker placement style game. And, uh, but it's, it's based on the life cycles of, of birds. And so some birds are in the wetlands, some are in the forest, some are, you know, brood parasites and some lay lots of eggs and some don't. And so the, the bird cards are actually, they're quite accurate. Um, and there's a joy that goes along with, with playing a game like that. Wow. Okay. Very cool. So, uh, one of the reasons I, I invited you to, to talk with me is I came across an essay you had written uh, on using creationism as an example in a critical thinking course. This is very similar to what I'm trying to do with my podcast uh, is to you know spread the rational view and, and have people think critically and apply the tools of science and skepticism to reaching conclusions. And you highlight that in your course, you are teaching the controversy. And this is, this has kind of been a buzzword and a mantra of anti-evolution groups in the U S especially trying to push religion into biology classrooms. Uh, could you explain uh, what you're doing when you're teaching the controversy? Sure. And I think that I'm, I'm using the term, uh, with a very tongue in cheek, um, because I, I use the term in a way that the creationists don't. Uh, and I think that the way that um, Meyer, who originally called for teaching the controversy, and the other intelligent design folks, um, I think that they want to pit it as that false equivalence or the idea that these are two opposing positions that hold equal weight from a scientific perspective or, or even from a philosophical perspective. Um, that those two concepts should be treated as equally valid uh, at the outset. And that's where I disagree entirely, because, of course, you've got one field with a ton of evidence, um, and you've got another that is essentially a, a, a thought experiment on how to preserve your beliefs without um, looking like you ignore science. Uh, but that fails as far as I'm mm-hmm, concerned. Mm-hmm. The way that I use the term teaching the controversy is I actually teach about the controversy. I don't pit those two ideas against each other. Okay. I explain in a you know kind of historical way where this controversy came from uh, or where this alleged controversy came from. And I um, describe it in terms of... Uh, two different styles of thinking. So a scientific style of thinking and a non-scientific style of thinking. Um, And I used a couple of anecdotal examples in that paper of how teaching this stuff has led to some real teachable moments in class where students have asked great questions that demonstrate that they're very engaged, but still a bit confused, which, I mean, if you teach, those are the best kinds of questions. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I, I really have felt that this has been a productive way to get students to think about why we can put our trust in scientific results, even if sometimes they don't replicate. Mm-hmm. The process itself is a self-correcting one. And I think that that's a really important thing to think consciously about. Um mm-hmm. And yeah, it's it's very important for me to demonstrate that here is the logic that I used to reject these premises. Here's the logic that many other good thinkers have used to reject these things. Um, and here's the failure of logic in the uh, opposing argument. And I think that we can't just tell them to take our words for it, because that would mean that I mean, that's just an authority bias, right? Yes, yes. If, if, they're, if it's an appeal to authority, if I just say, trust me, creationism is crap. Um, and I, I, want to, I want to walk the walk. I, I don't want students to just believe what I tell them. I want to model the thought process so that they can do it for themselves. Yeah, you, you'll often get creationists saying, well, you know, 
we're, we're equivalent. I believe in creationism. You believe in science. <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I think I, have, I think I have a trusting relationship with science. I, I don't, I don't think I have faith in science because faith is belief without evidence. And I don't have that with science. I have a lot of evidence to demonstrate to me, like you do in a good relationship, that this is worthwhile continuing. Indeed, indeed. I've actually uh, interviewed uh, quite a few religious people and, and looking at their views on on religion and, and science. And uh, the ones that I, I respect the most, you know, basically say that, you know, science doesn't give you evidence for God and they're not looking necessarily for evidence for God in their science. They're looking at, for, for their religion, it, it is a, a faith thing, faith, faith-based belief for them. And they, they take this on, on faith in a subjective personal type of thing. And their science is, is goes by evidentiary and skeptical rules. And as, as we know how science works, uh, and they don't mix the two typically. And I think that's a, um, you know, you can't argue against that approach. If you want to have those beliefs, then you can have those beliefs, but they aren't, you know, they aren't backed up by evidence and, and it's not something you're going to find in a science classroom. Um, and then the creationists, of course, the, the young earth creationists and the people pushing these theories into science and trying to set up this false dichotomy, you know, it's evolution or God did it. You know, well, no, this isn't the dichotomy. It's, you know, it's evolution or God did it or we're living in the matrix or aliens did it or the spaghetti monster did it or Thor did it or and there's a big long list you can go through. <laughs> I and I think that it's very important to me when I'm when I'm teaching about this to to not frame it as, you know, an argument between science and religion or spirituality. Um I, uh, I am not a religious person, um, but I was raised in a, in a religious family and those people are not idiots and those people are not poor thinkers. And to be honest, those people are also not creationists in the sense of the, you know, very aggressive sociopolitical kind of movement. Mm -hmm. Um, but they had, you know, very pro like I was raised by my grandparents who had very profound beliefs in in God and God's, you know, influence on the world. Um, mm -hmm. It was a very liberal church, so there was no conflict between, you know, scientific evidence. Um, but they felt that God un was the, you know, the foundation of of all of it. I don't have that belief, so it's not a leap for me to, you know, stick to a purely materialistic view of the world. Mm -hmm. Um, but I know that there are a lot of my students who, you know, have strong beliefs and I'm not trying to, I don't think it's my job to get them to give that up. Um, I, 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 I don't think that that is a necessary thing. If Francis Collins, uh, you know, associated with the, the human genome project can hold a, a strong belief and also, you know, spend a lifetime committed to understanding genetics I am pretty sure my students can get through a BA with uh, <laughs> you know, their understanding of science and their beliefs intact, and that it's not my problem to to mess with that. Uh, so I try to make it very clear that when I'm talking about creationism, what I'm talking about is is a very concerted effort that is anti scientific. I'm not talking about just having a belief that you know there's a a god or gods that has influenced things. Um, and I make it very clear that I feel in the non-overlapping magisteria kind of way that uh, those are questions that are dealing with things outside of the natural world. And so we can't address those with science because scientific method is only equipped to deal with things that are natural, that are material. And that, I think, is a misconception that many of the creationist leaders try to foist on their followers that the scientists are out to convert them to Satanism or, or away from God uh, into atheism is the godless um, scientists and their ivory towers are, are trying to corrupt the youth. Um, and I think most of the scientists that I speak of just have no necessarily opinion on the matter. Many of them have strong religious beliefs, in fact, as you say, and many of them don't, but it just doesn't enter the science. And if it does enter the science, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I also know plenty of people who, you know, have those, the strong 
religious beliefs and feel that studying science is their best way to understand the natural world, which they see as, you know, in, created in some way by their deity. Um, you know, God started it and evolution took over after that. I think that's a pretty common way that people rationalize those two uh, systems of understanding. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. why, why would I... I mean, that might be a really fun barroom conversation to have, but it's it's not the kind of thing that I'm going to tackle in class. So you uh, make reference to, uh, in your essay, Bill Nye uh, debating uh, Ken Ham, who is the, uh, the, <laughs> the founder of the Ark Encounter in Kentucky and leader of Answers of Genesis, I believe. Um, did Bill Nye make a mistake in debating Ken Ham? I think you could have. Uh, I think you could have multiple viewpoints on that. I know how strongly you know people like Dawkins and, and Jerry Coyne reacted to that. Um, I felt because I I listened to how people reacted to it, and it's it's not clear to me that Bill Nye legitimized. Ham. Um, I think that it was pretty clear to anyone who was willing to be convinced that one of those arguments was stronger than the other. And in particular, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the debate, but one of the things that gets asked is, what would it take for you to change your mind? And, you know, Bill Nye's got an answer. Mm -hmm. Bill Nye's got an answer to that in the sense of, you know, here are the various things that if they were presented to me, I would have to reconsider what I know to be true. And Ham responds with, there's nothing that would change his mind. And, and that's the fundamental uh, difference right there. And to have that juxtaposition and to be able to see that difference in the styles of thinking, mm -hmm. I think it was important for people to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's creationism in in Ham's case is more of a uh, an explanation of everything uh, that predicts nothing, and so it can't be falsified. It, you know, God works in mysterious ways. Uh, there's no way we can understand His intellect. So, therefore, if it doesn't make sense from our interpretation of what it should be, is it doesn't falsify. <laughs> but, I mean, cr the creationist leaders, the people that are, you know, at the pulpit all the time talking to millions of, of creationists, they're very charismatic speakers, and scientists typically are not. Uh, you know, Bill Nye stands out as a great communicator among scientists. Yeah. It's a small pool, though, right? This is he's a big fish in a small pool of, of communicators. I think it's also important to note that, I mean, Bill Nye is a man who's made a living out of science communication and, uh, you know, edutainment. Uh, he's not a professor. He's uh, he he has the scientific training. Um, but I mean, he's a he's a communicator. He's a he's a performer for a reason. He's good at that. Right. Yeah, yeah. And some of us are and some of us are not. Um, I went to a conference where, you know, I watched um, AC Grayling uh, speak for an hour from memorized notes about a you know philosophical understanding of creationism. And it was one of the most magnificent things that I have ever listened to. But unless you bring a dictionary and a thesaurus, there's a lot of people, you know, a lot of people that I grew up with that would struggle to um, understand what he was saying. Mm -hmm. I have the benefit of, uh, you know, pretty well fed vocabulary. And, you know, it was it was music to my ears. But I think that scientists and, and academics in general do struggle with making their ideas easily understood by people who are not academics. Um, yeah, I come from a working class background. I think uh, I might have a little more empathy for uh, for that sort of understanding of the world. And I, I do my best to, to try and bridge that gap with my students because a lot of them come from those backgrounds too. Yeah, uh, and that's one of the things that I struggle with or I, I, I try to tackle in a lot of my podcasts is communicating science and how best to... Um, spread the rational view as it were and get 
more evidence-based decisions into public policy and into the public sphere and enlighten people as to how to do this. And a lot of it is psychology. You're like, it's, <laughs> you know, and I'm not a psychologist. I'm learning as I, as I go along, but as a psychologist, what are, what are we doing wrong in communicating science to the masses? Why are we, why do we seem to be losing the battle? <laughs> Um, I, I do think that part of it is, you know, the style of communication that we're accustomed to. Um, we're accustomed to constantly questioning our own results because, again, that, that you know, layer of falsification um, is, is a really important aspect of the scientific method. And so when we present things to the general public, we often hedge with, you know, uh, what my grandpa would have called weasel words, um, you know, generally, on average, potentially, hypothetically, you know, all of those sorts of things are, can sound to someone who is not trained in science as we're not confident, um, that we, we don't have all the answers. And of course, we would agree, we don't have all the answers. Um, but most of us in science are okay with that because we know well, we're working on it. <laughs> we're, we're trying and we learn new things every day, which is why sometimes our scientific messages change. And I'm sure you've heard the frustration over the course of the pandemic with, well, you know, the people are saying different things every week, you know, how you keep up with it. Yeah. And I admit that's it's frustrating. Um, but I think that if you don't have a background in science, you don't really necessarily understand that we're collecting data as we go. And we're revising our understanding as we get new data. And that's not a bad thing. That's not a, you know, that's not wishy-washy. That's being responsive to what the, you know, the inductive logic about what does the data reveal. As we go along, we have to keep changing what we say about it. But I think that that gets lost in translation a lot of the time, especially when the scientists are telling the politicians and then the politicians are the ones communicating it. Um, that is a telephone game. Bad game of telephone. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't end well, does it? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> the communicating um, through politicians is, is not my favorite part of, of public life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Agreed. So you, uh, your, your, your bio says that you are interested in evolutionary psychology, um, oh, I'm going to ask you to be careful. Uh, I, I, I want you to be careful throwing that term around. Okay. Um, I actually, I am, uh, <laughs> so here's one of those times where my field, um, you know, has some divisions in it. I don't consider myself an evolutionary psychologist. And the reason I don't call myself an evolutionary psychologist is because I have some discomfort with uh, the methods used by a number of my colleagues in who call themselves evolutionary psychologists. Okay. Um, I, I do take an evolutionary approach to human behavior and I realize that it might sound like the same thing. Um, but you know, EP as a, you know, capital evolutionary and capital psychology as a kind of sub discipline has some problems associated with it. And I would rather not be part of those problems. Um, so I'm an experimental psychologist and, uh, you know, I do study topics that have, that it's important to look at from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, but I don't consider myself an evolutionary psychologist. Uh, so partly it is that the research that I do, we can't directly test evolutionary hypotheses with some of this stuff. Um, social behaviors don't fossilize well. And so you're always you always face that difficulty of, of teasing apart how much of this is biological, how much of this is learned. Um, you know, does the, does the culture have this because they're of these evolved predispositions or vice versa? And so I hesitate to say that I'm always looking at adaptations when I'm doing my research. I'm looking at human behavior. I consider evolutionary approaches to it, but I can't always say that I'm testing an evolutionary hypothesis. I see. Does that no? That's very good because I was going to challenge you on it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, because obviously it's very difficult to distinguish between an inherited trait and a learned adaptation. It's you know the nature versus nurture, and it, you know 
how to tell whether something is evolutionarily um, influenced by genetics or or is just a social uh, meme that that catches on and and, and carries through it yeah. seems to be a insoluble problem in some cases in some cases i mean there are some things where it's a lot easier so if it is a physiological process it's a lot easier to demonstrate you know a direct biological correlate and so it's a lot easier to say you know oh look we found it you know genes associated with this process and of course th th i'm not a behavior geneticist but there are people doing work on, you know, social and behavioral tendencies where they are finding these cool gene patterns. They are directly testing evolutionary hypotheses. Um, but what I do for the most part is it's, it's psychology. Um, I'm always looking at it evolutionarily, but yeah, I just have to, I feel like I need to be very careful about just so stories and yes, yes. Uh, over, overstepping because if I, if I want to claim to have methodological rigor, then again, I need to, I need to walk the walk on that one. Yeah. Well, I mean, some critics will say, you know, you can make a just so story for anything that you see and then you, you lose again, the falsifiability there. You can have a neat adaptation adaptive explanation for any particular trait in any particular situation and it, it becomes indistinguishable from creationism at that point yeah i think so that's good i mean you have the the proper approach what <laughs> could you describe something that is a well-supported finding that you know evolutionary behavior uh, as an expert do you have any any sort of like this is definitely evolution that you can share with us so I think that, you know, a number of the um, pieces of evidence that have come more out of, of medicine and, and physiology, I think, are useful. Uh, so, for example, looking at our taste preferences, um, which, you know, that's a psychological topic, right? When you talk about sensation and perception, when you talk about motivation, um, which is associated with how much we eat, how many calories we burn, all those sorts of things. Those are very much psychological topics. Um, but we've got some really, really good concrete evidence about, you know, here are the taste buds. This is universal across our species. Um, uh, yes, we can have learned effects on flavor preference, which is another important thing to know, um, which includes social learning and, and firsthand learning. But you never, you can't outlearn those inherited flavor preferences that you come into this world with. You can modify them within a range, um, but mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. can't overturn them. Like, I can't learn to crave celery no matter how much I can <laughs> try. Um, that's, that's not about to happen. Um, and I'm fully willing to go with genetic determinism on that one and just give up on celery. I'm fine with that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and then you have the, the sweet tooth. You have to get your calories for energy, and that. Yeah, I actually have more of a fat tasting tooth. Um, it's not. It's not as much of a sweet tooth. It's more. You know, does it crunch? Uh, that's that, that's that's my tooth right there. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that a lot of those physiological effects are far easier. That doesn't mean it's worthless to study social behaviors from that perspective. I just think that we have to have some humility about how much we can understand. I mean, nature and nurture, that's been the fundamental question in psychology since psychology became a discipline. Um, mm -hmm. You know, those were questions that its founders were, were wrestling with. And we've made progress on them. But, you know, when you take a look at um, heritability quotients, for example, you can come up with these, you know, numbers that tell you how heritable a particular trait, like a personality trait or intelligence as measured by IQ, you can make an estimate, but with heritability estimates, you're only ever looking at the population level. Uh, so these are statistics that are meant for, you know, assessing the heritability within the sampled group um, or, or a slightly larger population than that. They're no good at predicting anything about an individual person. So it's, um, and most people who come into psychology want to know something about the individual person. Uh, they want to know about themselves. They want to know about their mom. They want to know about the person they want to help. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. And so those, those population level answers are often unsatisfying for a lot of people in, in psychology. And I think that they, they get frustrated with that. Wow. That's a lot like quantum mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> They're practically the same. Because <laughs> we have, you know, all these particles and, you know, we can tell 
we can predict how the average will vary and how all of the the population of particles will very accurately uh, pr uh, go through an experiment. But any particular one, you know, we just throw up our hands. We have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And we, honestly, we use a lot of the same t statistics for modeling that stuff. Uh, so, yeah, I feel your pain. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So your research that you've published on is very broad. I mean, animal learning and behavior, human meat choice and competition and post-secondary education. Have you combined these in any way or... <laughs> Um, I, I kind of pride, I pride myself on being a bit of a generalist within the field of psychology. So I, um, some of my favorite stuff to teach is, you know, the introductory psychology class, which is all of it. Um, and the history of psychology is another class that I teach. But of course, I'm located at, you know, a, a very student focused um, liberal arts and science kind of institution. It's an undergrad only institution. Uh, we don't have the same kind of, you know, publish or perish expectations that you would see at the, you know, the some of the bigger schools. Um, it's certainly nothing like what I experienced when I was at McMaster, for example. It's a very different kind of ethos. Mm -hmm. Very focused on students. We're expected to keep doing research, but it's... We're, we're expected to have research that really helps us to train undergraduates in research methodology. So... Over the years, my approach has been, you know, nurture these bright students, um, you know, don't kill their curiosity uh, and have them come up with projects that are generally within my wheelhouse. And that wheelhouse has, uh, you know, had a couple of additions over the years. And uh, my I mean, my graduate work was all with animal learning and behavior, social learning. Um, and, you know, I've published on that. But when I got a job at McEwen, I had no rat lab, you know, and the, the focus of my job was teaching. And so I needed to find a way to keep doing research, but to do it uh, cheaply <laughs> um, in a way that incorporates undergraduate researchers. So honors thesis students, independent study students, that kind of thing. Um, the occasional dedicated volunteer. Um, and because I didn't have that, you know, massive pressure to publish, um, it's, it's kind of fun to be able to just follow your interests and, and pick and choose what you, what you follow up on. So I've had, you know, dozens of students do projects that are eminently unpublishable, but they learned a lot from them. And, uh, you know, my career is at no risk because something didn't, didn't turn out in the lab, right? Uh, I'm, I'm valued in my role because of my teaching and my mentorship of students. Uh, and so the, um, the emerging research that I've done has focused on things that are relatively easy to measure uh, in an adolescent or in a, you know, undergraduate population. Um, I've gotten involved with some good collaborations. And so that brings me out of my comfort zone and makes me learn new things. Mm -hmm. um, and then the post-secondary education stuff is because of my interest in teaching. So I've become excited about the, you know, the scholarship of teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that the creationism paper is an example of the, um, you know, the focus on pedagogy. Why do we do things in particular ways and sharing that with other educators? Uh, so it's a great way to get inspired uh, to try something new is to read those kinds of journals. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and then so you instead of having <clears throat> instead of having a rat lab, you have uh, students to, to work on, and then you can measure their performance. And do you, do you try different teaching methods and, and compare the results? Yep, yep. We've uh, uh, you know have found some interesting things about um, you know people's perceptions of online learning, for example. Uh, and some of this is stuff that I've only shared, you know, with my colleagues you know, at the same university, uh, I've presented stuff to, you know, round table forums and things there. Uh, but some of it is, is being published. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun stuff. It's nice to be able to think about your teaching and have that count as your research. Um, it's, it's a nice twofer. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And, and the human mate choice and competition, is that also uh, studying your students? Uh, yes and no. Uh, so we've gone beyond the student population for some of that. 
Um, but uh, this this is research. This is a line of research that I'm absolutely loving. But it really did come from the ideas that my undergraduate students brought to me. Oh. And, uh, you know, we just we went from there uh, Two in particular that they worked really well together. And, you know, we developed some stuff and uh, they were each able to, you know, go to some conferences and present things. But then we followed up on it. And one of them is he's now just finished his Ph.D., and we've been continuing to c collect data at a couple of different institutions and more broadly for, for years now. Uh, so it's it's been a lot of fun. We've been looking mainly at, um, so personality styles, um, variants associated with the quote-unquote dark triad, uh, so narcissism, uh, Machiavellianism and psychopathy, mm -hmm. mild versions, not clinical versions of them. But those personality variants, we're taking a look at how that relates to um, mate choice behavior and uh, things like promiscuity and uh, other sort, as well as looking at uh, correlations with sexual orientation. Um, and there's some really interesting stuff there because men and women don't make the same mate choices uh, and don't have the same mating behaviors, but people of different uh, sexual orientations also don't have the same patterns of behavior. Hmm. Uh, and there may be some, you know, intervening personality variables there, which some it's some juicy stuff. That sounds interesting. Uh, I'll have to go look that up. <clears throat> <laughs> I can send you copies. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's very good. So your, your work on, on uh, critical thinking is, is basically an undergraduate course uh, where you're, you're, is this first year undergraduates that you're teaching this to? Or? So where, where I'm teaching creationism is actually in my evolution and human behavior class, um, because this is a group that is already, you know, I know they've already got the, the basics of evolution well in hand, because we've already covered that in class. And then I spend some time talking about, okay, you might have heard of creationism. Let's talk about what that means and uh, how we can understand it from the perspective of cognitive errors that people make, but also persuasion techniques that, that people use. So it's all psychology, um, and I feel like it's a, uh, the evolution of human behavior class is a worthwhile place to talk about that. But I've also talked about it in uh, one of my colleagues teaches a fourth year seminar in critical thinking. Um, and pseudoscience, and so he and I have have tag teamed on on this topic before. Um, it, we really pride ourselves in our department for you know really trying to get our students to practice critical thinking because uh, you can't just tell them to do it. Yeah, you have to give them the tools to be able to to recognize when they're taking part in it. Uh, that's you know it's very easy to fool yourself, and I think that that's one thing that we as scientists are are always trying to do is question our biases because we're aware that, you know, biases uh, can get into your research and it can drive you in the wrong direction. And that's, you know, science is self-correcting because uh, every now and then someone goes down the wrong path and publishes a, a, a paper and, it, you know, and for some reason it gets through. It seems to be that science is in the long run self-correcting and it goes back and someone will not be able to reproduce it or will falsify that work. And although not every paper is, is correct, we eventually circuitously approach uh, a closer resemblance to, to reality, I think, uh, through this process. And, and this isn't something that's done in creationism. Creationism starts with a book and then tries to interpret everything in light of the book, I think. And, and one of the, one of the, uh, the ways of thinking of, of this that I, when I'm you know, interacting with creationists online, for example, or people that have been brought up in this, in this mindset is to, you know, get them to try to question their biases and recognize these in the, the failures is very difficult to do. Uh, you know, it takes a lot of patience and <clears throat> to get through to people because you, you're attacking their beliefs, right? And, and they uh, automatically, close up. It's very difficult to have the communication with these people to get a, a trust. You need a trust communication with these people, I think, to actually make any headway. Uh, and typically you're not 
trying to convince the person you're arguing with. You're trying to convince the quiet people that are watching the argument. <laughs> you don't have much hope yeah. of convincing the person you're arguing with in most cases, I think. <clears throat> I think, too, that there's, uh, there's another, um, and this is, again, a, a psychological reason why it can be difficult to have that conversation, or at least have that conversation on an evil, even playing field. Because a number of the, um, you know, the practices that are associated with a number of religious traditions actually suppress that questioning thinking. Um, that there's, there's an active part of the, the religious system that suggests that if you feel yourself doubting, you need to stop that thinking. And so that thought stopping, it's literally called thought stopping. Um, I mean, it's consistent. You see it in a number of, of cults, uh, but you also see it in a number of, of religious groups where um, even the, you used the phrase earlier, you know, the, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Um, that's used as a way to stop those kinds of, of doubtful thoughts mm -hmm. or critical thoughts. And those are used, I don't, I don't necessarily know that people are using those to prevent people from thinking. I think that, I mean, if I were going to be generous about it, I would say that those sorts of statements probably emerged so that people had an easier time reconciling their beliefs with what they're seeing in the world. But there becomes a pattern of thinking where, okay, I have a conclusion that I have to stick to, and I already know that I can't understand it. So if I see something that I can't understand, I have to just dismiss it and 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 put it in that category of things that can't be questioned. Mm. Um, so that that pattern of thinking, that habit, is trained, and it can be challenging to get people to recognize that they themselves are limiting their own thinking as a result of those trained patterns. Mm. So yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, so you, you talk about thought stopping as an actual process that's taught. Um, there's also probably a um, more subtle uh, pressure to not think this way uh, due to the risk of ostracization from your peer group. Right. And th this is a, a self stopping thing without, you know, you don't have to teach people to stop it. They, re they realize they're now questioning the, the basis of their uh, belonging to this group and that stops the thought quite quickly too. Yeah, we're, you know, as a social species, we are incredibly sensitive to the reactions of other people, any kind of disapproval, um, any kind of scorn, any sort of, you know, especially if it comes from someone that you respect and, you know, for people who have pretty good emotional intelligence, picking up on those cues, they do it very quickly. So, you know, they start, a sentence that begins with, I wonder, I wonder why, or I wonder if, and they see the, the look that is like, mm, where are you going with this, buddy? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it, it doesn't take much to stop someone for, at least from expressing those thoughts. And if you're, if you regularly realize that expressing those thoughts is dangerous to your social safety, then you might actually stop thinking them because it's not productive. Yeah, that's 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 very interesting. Um, I love exploring the you know the nuance of, of persuasion and um, how to communicate science. I've I've read papers on you know just stating the facts doesn't convince people, right? And just yelling the facts louder and louder, which is what most I think pro science people on the internet do is when you're challenged, you start listing facts and it, it's very it's very easy to fall into that regime because that you're trained to to respond with a logical argument and and but it just doesn't work what i mean what should we be doing to be more persuasive in these situations if we want to you know get people to to question or to question their biases or to look at the facts. It's, it's not, you don't just throw facts at them, right? It, it, it doesn't seem to help. I think that there are, I think there are a lot of things that we can use from, uh, you know, the study of, of pedagogy, the study of teaching. Um, I think there are also a lot of things that we can learn from advertising. Uh, <laughs> um, mm. You know, clearly there's a good reason for me to watch Mad Men again. Uh, there's, uh, 
I think there are things that we can learn from, you know, hostage negotiation techniques. That I think there are a lot of things where we need to give people a reason to change their minds. And we also need to give them the safety um, to change their minds. So when I, I mean, I, I use hostage negotiation as an example and not lightly. One of the most important things in that kind of negotiation process is allowing the person to have an out, allowing the person to have a way to save face, allowing that person to be able to change their mind with dignity. And I think that, you know, as science communicators, especially for those of us who are engaged with denialist um, arguments, Mm -hmm. I do think that we need to give people the, uh, I I think we have to be generous with our, our ability to be nice to people who are struggling with it, with an idea. Mm-hmm. When I think about, you know, and this is a little too real right now, but, you know, anti-vaxxers and, uh, you know, other sorts of conspiracist or, or denialist mm-hmm. movements like with climate change and, and things like that, it, I, I find it difficult to find common ground with those groups. And I find it difficult to be generous with my um, my opinion, my attitude towards them. Indeed. But at the same time, I, it's really difficult to yell at someone to make them change their minds. Um, allowing them an opportunity to see that you are not trying to harm them, that you're not trying to take anything away, uh, and to give them an opportunity to practice those cognitive skills that are necessary for them to come to their own conclusions. Um, I mean, there's an old joke that's, you know, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? You only need one, but the light bulb has to want to change. And I think <laughs> there's, I think there's an element of that when we are arguing with these sorts of beliefs that they they have to be motivated to to see something new. And I think that when you have to inspire them to do that, you can't just bully them into it. That's a good point. I think that's that's. That's worth remembering, um, and it's very difficult to. It's very sometimes sometimes very cathartic to yell, <laughs> especially if you've done it over and over. Yeah, I like to do that in, in my car <laughs> by myself. I just yell in my car, and people just think that I'm singing along with heavy metal or something. And that's awesome. oh, that's good. Uh, yeah. Well, it's it's been a pleasure chatting with you about this. Uh, this has been quite a, a broad ranging discussion, um, <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's very very interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm gathering information and trying to become a better uh, speaker and a better outreach person for science, and, and you know trying to learn strategies and, and methods of, of of doing this while I'm learning the facts as well of, of all of these interesting arguments. So I uh, really appreciate your insights and, and it lo- sounds like you're having a lot of fun teaching. So that's, I do. Yeah. And that's uh, pretty cool. To be honest, I'll, I'll talk about this stuff until your ears bleed. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I it, it gives my family a break, honestly, <laughs> for me to have someone else to talk to. So before I sign off, I have a question that I ask a lot of my uh, my guests. Okay. Uh, I'm just interested in what kind of science fiction do you like? Do you, do you are you interested in science fiction? Do you have a favorite author or show or? Yeah, um, this household is is full of uh, science fiction and fantasy. Um, do I have to just tell you one? No, no, you, you can you can tell me many if you'd like. Uh, okay, I'll I'll stick to the science fiction. I will, I promise. Um, so my favorite right now is uh, a series by uh, Martha Wells called The Murderbot Diaries. And there's a, a series of four novellas, and then there's a, a novel. Um, and oh my goodness, they make me they make me so happy. Um, she's a she's a very snarky, uh, charming writer. And uh, Murderbot, the character, is is fantastic. Murderbot is a um, uh, has human parts, but is an AI as well. And 
is fed up with humanity and is very, very uh, angry most of the time and has an internal <laughs> monologue that, that greatly resembles what I sound like when I'm in my car by myself. Um, <laughs> and this is, you know, there's, there's deep space travel, there's, um, you know, interstellar planetary intrigue. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on at once, but it's Murderbot as a character is, is probably my favorite thing right now. Uh, so I strongly recommend Murderbot. The first book is called, or the first novella is called All Systems Red. And uh, start there and enjoy yourself. Okay, I, I'll, I will have to look that up. That sounds, it reminds me a little bit about Douglas, of Douglas Adams. He had a character that had to go around and insult everybody in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> I think Douglas Adams would have loved Murderbot so hard. Um, and it's Hugo Award winning. Like I'm not the only one who thinks this stuff That's is great. Good. So I'll have to look it up. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, I'm going to send you a Rational View T-shirt for coming on and chatting with me. Yay! Uh, so thank you so much, and uh, maybe we'll chat again later. Excellent. Thanks very much. If you'd like to follow up with more in-depth discussions, please come find us on Facebook at The Rational View and join our discussion group. If you like what you're hearing please consider visiting my patron page at patron.podbean.com slash the rational view. Thanks for listening.